All right, welcome everybody. I'm glad to see everybody still here. Has, it has been a great turnout uh, this evening. Um, my name is Arendt. I'm going to be doing the last presentation together with Simon here in front of me, who will be taking over from me in a little bit. Um, we are both engineers working on FP Bind Gen, which is a tool that we will be talking about in a little bit. Um, the talk is uh, fiber plane providers and uh, the path to full stack WASM plugins. Um, I'll first be presenting an overview. Um, what are fiber plane providers? That's going to be the first topic. I'll talk a little bit how, about how they fit into our product. And then I'll get on to our history with WASM, because even before we started working on these providers, we were already uh, using WASM in our stack, and that heavily influenced also uh, the tool that we built. And then I will talk about FP BindGen itself. FP BindGen is the bindings generator that we use for WASM. Um, and we'll get to that in a bit. And after that, Simon will take over for a handsome demo. So first, what are fiber plane providers? Well, Mies already showed our product a little bit. Um, our product is a collaborative notebook. Think like Google Docs or Notion, but more aimed towards developers and SREs. And a critical feature of this focus on DevOps is that uh, we can integrate graphs, tables, logs straight into our notebooks and populate them with data coming from your infrastructure. Um, that raises a problem because how do you get data securely from somebody's infrastructure into our notebooks? And that is the problem that uh, the providers are aimed to solve. So they connect to an arbitrary data source, regardless of where the data source is, and transform it to something that we can use in our notebooks. Now, a very important part of that is that is that how do you connect to the data source itself? Because some data sources might be available pu publicly through the web. Some you might need a VPN to access. And yet others might not be directly accessible at all. Um, so depending on the network topology involved, the provider will either run as a plugin in your browser for a direct access uh, data source, or it runs inside of a proxy server that the customer has to install in their network. And that explains why we have to focus on a full stack solution. Unfortunately, if you have to run something both in the browser and on a server, your options are extremely limited. You're roughly down to JavaScript or WASM. Well, uh, I understand that most of you will know what WASM is, but for those that don't, uh, it's basically a sandbox that allows you to run compiled code written in whatever language in a runtime uh, that could be a browser or a server. Now, we're Fiberplane. We are a Rust shop. So for us, the WASM option uh, is considerably more attractive. Um, but it's also really important to focus on the security aspect of it, because it is a sandbox. You can expose functionality to it. But that is really the only functionality the code running inside that sandbox can use, which makes it great for plugins such as providers that may be developed by third parties also. So that is uh, what providers are and why we wanted, uh, why we used WASM plugins to write them. Now, before, like I mentioned, before we started working on these providers, we were already using WASM. Um, our front-end stack is basically a React Redux application. Um, but we also, because it's a collaborative notebook, we have some very complex code dealing with uh, operational transformation for conflict resolution. Like multiple people are working in the notebook at the same time. How do you deal with conflicts? Um, that is the OT logic uh, that I mentioned here. And this logic is also running both on the server, where it runs as native uh, Rust code, but also, again, with WASM in the browser. Um, and our, our setup for that was pretty typical. Uh, we use WASM bind gen, which is kind of like the go-to solution, solution if you want to run Rust code inside of your browser. Um, and it worked, but the, uh, the TypeScript definitions that come out of it were not really sufficient for our use case. So we also integrated TSRS for, uh, for having better TypeScript types. And we even uh, contributed a few patches to TSRS. But despite that, it's, the maintenance was never really pleasant because 
We got the function definitions coming from wasn't gen. We got the type definitions coming from TSRS. And we always had to do a bit of manual uh, fiddling to get things working uh, together. And unfortunately, uh, wasn't gen relies on JSON serialization for passing complex data types back and forth. And for us, that was really becoming a bottleneck in the performance of how we were dealing uh, with this code. So then comes along a use case where we re really need full stack uh, wasn't plugins. We have all this exper uh, experience with these tools, tools already. Wasn't bind gen, well, we already saw the downside, but it simply cannot be used server side. So that's where we really get our hands dirty. And we developed FP bind gen. FP bind gen is similar to wasn't bind gen but it's really uh, designed from a full stack uh, point of view. So it, we created two runtimes, it can generate two runtimes for you, one Rust runtime and one TypeScript runtime. And inside those Rust uh, runtimes, you run your code. Uh, that is, again, also written in Rust. Um, a lot of those uh, binding generators, they feature like a custom DSL that you define your protocol in. We decided not to do that. We use Rust plus a few macros as our source of truth for the protocol. And from that, we generate the bindings both for your guest plugins and for the runtimes. Um, this fits very nicely into yeah, our Rust workflow. Um, and not unimportant, rather than JSON serialization, we opted to use message pack, which is a little bit more efficient. And also very importantly, uh, it allows us to pass binary blobs efficiently between the two sites because Let's take uh, a provider plus the OT logic if they have to work efficiently together. You don't want to be serializing, deserialize, deserializing at every part where you copy the data around. So we just we are now able to pass binary blobs around, which helps us a lot with the performance. Now, I could talk endlessly to you guys about the nitty gritty of this stuff, but I think this is the moment where Simon can take over and show you. So yeah, uh, to start off, my name is Simon Rasmussen, as Aaron pointed out. I work together with him on FP BindGen and our provider model that he so eloquently explained. Uh, so here I'll give a short demo of how we implement a FP provider and how this interacts with FP BindGen and how simple it is actually to get started with this. So first, I will not that one, I will go here and I will show how our provider protocol looks. So this is our protocol uh, definition where we start out with an FP import. So this is basically saying that the Watson module will have access to these imported functions. For example, it should be able to log some messages. It should be able to make some HTTP requests to actually fetch the data. Uh, it also needs to have access to the current timestamp and as well as some random values in case that's needed. And then in our FP export block here, we say that the module must export an invoke function, which takes a request, uh, some configuration data, that can be a, a message pack blob, basically can deserialize however it would like, and then return a provider response. Uh, for example, if we look at provider response, we see that it has some error data it can return, or an instant, or series, auto suggestions, various different things that we request the provider to provide in this studio. So, I'm not going to invoke this and anger the demo god, so I'll keep hands off. Um, rather, I will show how we then use this uh, generated code uh, on the Wasm plugin side of things. So I have started out with some code here. Uh, here is the FP export input of the FP provider saying that, okay, this invoke function uh, must exist, then it uh, gets bound up to the right auto-generated name that can then be picked out up outside the Wasm module. There's some fancy macro uh, stuff in there that you can ask into later if you're interested. Uh, but for now, I'll show that we can basically just match on our request. And then we have a provider request. So in this case, we'll abuse the log. Um, no, not blocks for this. Uh, so we want um, provider request. Auto suggest like that. And then we will return a provider response, auto suggestions, and 
Rust Analyzer is very helpful and fills out stuff for us. Uh, so here, uh, what we're actually building is a very dumb provider that gives you access to querying what time is it in a time zone. So there is this nice worldtimeapi.org that is not a sponsor, but we'll <laughs> use their API for tonight uh, to query stuff. Um, and I've just defined some uh, random time zones that we want to give out as uh, auto suggestions uh, in the UI. Uh, so we can iterate over our time zones. If I can type map. And then we return a suggestion for each of them. And then it has some text. That's our s.2 string. Doo, 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 doo. And then we have a description that is just none. Then we take this and we collect it, and then we're pretty much done. So of course we have some other stuff we don't care about for now. We can just mark it as to do that. I have to deal with that later. Um, so based on that, I can go over here. I hope you guys can see this. There's a demo you also didn't see. Um, so yes, as you can see here, we also have our FP tool, which is a CLI tool that can interact with these compiled WASM modules. So if I go here, I go up, I build it. You just have to trust that's in the right uh, WASM build directory. <laughs> um, I can basically run that here. Uh, so you can see that I pass in a request here that says, oh, please give me an auto suggestion and uh, an empty configuration value. Shall I zoom more perhaps? that um, and this basically just runs the wasm module you can see here as yes, out to the side demo provider blah 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 uh, so when i run this it will take a little bit to compile the wasm and then it will actually execute return the data back as a message pack blob and then we deserialize it again as uh, javascript so it's a little or json so it's a little bit easier to see here um, and this can, of course, also interact with the other providers, so you can demo it during your setup or if you're developing your own provider. But uh, naturally, this is not the most useful thing. Uh, so let's go ahead and actually implement the interesting part where we go and query stuff. Um, so there we have a provider request again. In this case, we're going to abuse the logs. Uh, so if we call this a queue. So what do we have to here? Well, we have to make an HTTP request, which we noted before we can actually import. Uh, so we have our FP provider crate that's been generated from the um, protocol we described before. And we have a make HTTP request function that we can just grab, make HTTP request. And then we have an HTTP request type that has a URL. We can format it and we say we have our base URL. And then we have a slash and then it's API slash our query time zones, as far as I remember. Do, 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 do. And then an actual query, which we then get from our queue here. So this is the input. So this is the query that will actually be passed in there. Um, so that formats the URL and that is just a string. So that's fine for now. The method is then an HTTP method get headers is none and body is also none. So like that, we can take this, we can await it uh, to make this happy. We need to wrap it in some blocks. Response. Like that. So based on this, we get a response back. Uh, from the ACP, which may or may not fail. Uh, so we should actually take this and uh, map the error. In this case, we don't really care what happens here, but uh, we will return a provider response of an error. Error is the error something. Something bad happened. We're sad, <laughs> unfortunately, but it happens. Have to make this a string to make our life easier. 
And with that, we can use our trust your question operator, I think. And then down here, we know that in the end, we want to return some provider request of our logs so that we can show a nice table in our studio for it, which I'll demo in a bit. Uh, so here, we need to return a vec and then a log, log record. Um, so for this, the body, I need to check my cheat sheet now, because I don't remember. <laughs> uh, so here, code is a little bit different. I'm gonna steal this while I'm at it. So as you can see here, the response we get back from the API is just some trivial JSON. So we can use our trusty old friend, Certi, uh, to actually uh, deserialize this. We define a struct that fits this data. And then, uh, again, need to switch over. And it was API time zone, not time zones. Important to get right. I'm not a Mac user, as you can maybe tell. <laughs> My CEO is trash talking me <laughs> while I'm doing a live demo. Hmm. That's a new one. <laughs> but uh, we'll deal with it. So in order to not bore you too much, I'll copy paste a bit of stuff here. Provider response. Logs. Oops. <laughs> you say that until it airs out on you. Um, so, have you ever given a live demo with JavaScript? I don't think this better. Um, did we do everything correctly here, logs queued. Back of a log record. <laughs> we can. Maybe that's easier. Then you don't have to wait. <laughs> hey, audience suggestion, don't blame me. Um, all right, so let's compile the WASM module. Then we have another command line up here we can run instead, and I'll zoom in. Again, it's a little bit hard to see. Maybe if I okay, that just disappeared. Uh, logs here. Yeah, so in this case, you can see we will actually send out a query that says, hey, please give me uh, the time and date for Europe slash Copenhagen time zone. Um, and if I run it here, oh no, it's decided to compile. Well, I can demo it over here meanwhile. Um, so since Studio is not the most easy thing in the front end, which I, I mean, I'm a back end guy, so I don't know what's going on here. I just uh, overwrote our Loki query provider. Um, so I can actually put this in here, Europe slash Copenhagen. And then if I execute this, we get some data back here. So we can see at the current time is the exact same time in Denmark currently. And the abbreviation that we got back from the API was CEST. Um, and the demo boss have smitten me. Didn't compile. <laughs> uh, base your, uh, oh no. <laughs> Evan uh, <laughs> cursed me before the demo, as usual. <laughs> but I think I can do this here. Key binding. Oops. And it didn't find the module now? Yeah, okay, I understand why. Because it's not in repo anymore, it's a little bit out from here. Ta-da, we get the same thing. <laughs> 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 so.
So admittedly not the most smooth uh, live demo in the universe, but uh, as you can see, even under pressure, it's quite easy to develop this. And uh, it's basically thanks to <laughs> Aaron's uh, brainchild of FP BindGen that basically does all of the binding work. So the CLI tool basically just invokes this uh, generated runtime code that instantiate a Wasmer module, compiles it with the right compiler, sets up the module, the memory, everything's basically handled. Just say, hey, please invoke that function, give it this data, done. Um, and also serializes back and forth for you, handles complex types, asynchronous calls back and forth, everything just works. So yeah. No, it's not a question, it's a, it's a dumb statement. So basically it's uh, Lambda. Yep. Um, so, so, so the statement is it, it's somewhat comparable to, to AWS Lambda and, and I think indeed there, there is some similarity. Um, of, of course, this is not aimed towards achieving scalability. Uh, so, so the purpose is, is, is different, but indeed um, it, it's a standalone function that runs inside of a sandbox and uh, uh, that you use for isolating certain uh, logic. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a comparison there, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, so I haven't really looked into uh, Wasm yet, Wasm yet, but you mentioned async. So could I write an asynchronous function, basically an asynchronous web server, and compile that with FP bind chain to Wasm and then run that? Uh, Can I use Tokyo, in other words? You no. cannot use Tokyo inside okay. uh, inside those plugins. Um, because I think the main reason for that is because the plugin um, needs to respond to a request coming from outside, and the async logic is is triggered from outside rather than having an event loop that is running internally. Yeah, similar to Lambda. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, so you're saying that this code has been run on the client's premises, right? So yeah, uh, customers can indeed. The customer's uh, premises. And yeah. you are the provider of this code. So you are developing these modules that yeah. are deployed on customer's side. And you basically define what this sandbox can do, right? So mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, are your customers fine with this? Like? Because well, you, you basically deploy any code to their environment. Like, it, 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 you could say it is any code, but uh, to earn our customers' trust, we also open source uh, all this code. So they are free to inspect everything uh, there. And uh, the whole provider SDK, uh, we're in the process of open sourcing that. Uh, I, I don't have a d concrete ETA for you, but uh, we, yeah, there will be more on this front. Yeah, it's basically the whole end-to-end -end thing. So even the FP... Uh, bind gen part, the one that generates the code that we run, uh, that is open source, so you can spec that. And you, the code it generates is also actually checked in, uh, so you can see that doesn't change. You can compile it yourself. Uh, we call it our uh, proxy and pro, uh, provider, and that's what you will run your infrastructure, which loads WASM modules that you are free to replace um, and compile those WASM modules yourself based off the providers that we publicly release. And how does your deployment model look like? Do you depend on whatever you want, or is this like uh, it'll basically schedule it releases or something? Um, so for the stuff running in the customer's uh, network, they'll basically be responsible for updating it. Yeah. Yeah. Also, just more of a statement um, um, for uh, uh, utility. Uh, so, um, I saw that you didn't want to go into the, the, the proc macro, right? I can. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, um, uh, as a, you know, a, budget, uh, a rest uh, group, I think we should drop the fear for, uh, for proc macros as well. Because uh, when I started doing Rust, I was like, oh, no, all this scary proc macro stuff. And then I stripped it down completely to the bare bone. I, I kicked out SYN. I kicked out all the tools that you use to build a proc macro. And then you realize that it's actually a very simple token tree that you get and you output a token tree that you give back. And everything you do in between is just up to you, really. You can use SYN. You can use high complicated parsers. But you can also just write your own. So um, when I started with proc macros, I got lost in this, you know, oh, no, this is so scary, you know. Mm -hmm. Working with SYN is, is just 
Ah, oh, UX. But um, um, yeah, so I would just like to make a note that um, it's really not scary. And, and compile time reflection is, I think, probably the, the core strength of Rust that everyone should just embrace and be able to write these macros. So. <laughs> yeah, sure, but you know. <laughs> That's a, it's a good point. Uh, it, it's a little bit of expert knowledge, I would say, but it definitely does have to be scary. Yeah, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. <laughs> so, uh, as you guys know, I'm a big fan of Epic <laughs> Bungie, really awesome stuff. I was wondering, do you have any tips or maybe possible future solutions to increase the productivity of developers who are going to write plugins? Because writing a WebAssembly plugin and then basically recompiling it and running it inside of some sort of runtime. It poses a unique set of challenges, and I was wondering what your thoughts on are on how you could basically improve on this in the future. I feel like this is a very targeted question about future development, <laughs> possibly maybe that you've already been let in on. Um, <laughs> no, so currently our um, protocol definition is a little bit, uh, shall I say, bare bones in terms of you have to wrap your protocol definition in uh, in a actual. Um, declarative macro instead, which outputs some function that keeps track of the different types and stuff. And this makes it a little bit hard saying, oh, okay, these functions must be implemented for the protocol to be valid and some are optional and stuff like that. So one of the sort of not innovations, but future plans we have in this area is to basically you define traits instead and say, hey, this is my exported protocol and this is my imported protocol. And then that uh, trade will then just be something that you implement in your WASM module and something that you implement in your uh, provider runtime implementation. Um, so for example, we glossed over it here, but how did this WASM module actually make the HTTP request? Well, that lives in the runtime implementation you have to supply for the provider, uh, for the provider protocol part of it, yeah. yeah. So that's something that's in the works and should make it more clear what's going on because you'll be implementing the same trait both in your front in your uh, runtime and in your plugin um, so you sort of have that red thread throughout the whole thing cool, thanks uh, one other thing i could add to that is um, right now the bindings that we generate are purely aimed towards wasm um, but one th uh, idea that we're also exploring is to generate one set of bindings that just targets purely native code so that you can invoke the functions that you define for your plugin, not through WASM, but directly through ordinary Rust for writing unit tests so that this becomes easily testable also uh, with your ordinary debugger as well. Nice. I have also two questions. First, uh, uh, how, uh, how big your VAS model is after compilation? In, gen in general, for example, some simple code, uh, how big uh, WASM uh, binary can be? I don't have any concrete size examples. Kilobytes, so megabytes? Yeah, so by default, if you just uh, compile it debug mode and stuff, the WASM modules are basically huge. Um, there's uh, a few things you can do. So there's a WASM optimizer you can run it through. But some of the biggest size benefits we saw was actually enabling a very new feature of the Rust compiler uh, in the cargo.toml. You can tell it to strip the binaries. Uh, this basically removes a lot of the debug symbols and info saying, oh, okay, this function panicked here and there. But because there's no stack traces or anything uh, easily in WASM anyway, it's very, there's no loss in actually stripping out the binaries. Uh, that gave at least a 50% uh, decrease in size. Okay, but I, um, think, I think concretely our production providers are around 100k. That don't pin me to an exact number, but I think that's 150k oh, and 500k <laughs> for uh, FiberKit. Okay. Yeah, that uh, that one has a lot of logic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and another question: You mentioned you were using Vasmr, yeah, yes. for execution, and uh, did you compare with Vasm time? Uh, why mm. did you choose Vasmr? Aaron That's that. no particular reason. Well, frankly, I don't have a complete answer on that one either because uh, that was kind of made before my time. Um, 
But basically, the, the short answer is we have it on our to-do list. We have an issue for it. So if, if you feel like I, I would like a wasn't time, then please vote there. Um, we, we ultimately want to support both. But for okay. ourselves, we use Wasmer, so that, that's why that one uh, was okay. implemented first Thank for you. FB Bindgen. All right, if there are no other questions, then I would like to thank you all for coming and feel free to take another beer or snack and have a good evening. Thank you.